and we got up to Acts chapter 9 and uh, been laboring kind of in that area because there's so much to deal with. By the way, the, the tapes, call them tapes yet, <laughs> are on YouTube, I think, now. I saw them pop up the other day. If you got the email from um, Hannah, and the, the previous Acts studies are on there, most of them. So if you need to review some of that, have at it. I don't like to watch myself. I have, but it's not my favorite thing to do because I see all the, the mannerisms I have no idea I'm doing. Pulling my pants up, which are not hanging down. Adjusting my glasses, which are fine. Scratching my head, which doesn't itch. I mean, you start watching these tapes, and I say, oh, no, I'm not going to watch any more of that. <clears throat> you guys, Bill knows what I'm talking about, probably. <laughs> he said, was that me? Did I do that? Ooh, no. Well, anyhow, welcome, and the pastor will be back next Sunday. Next Sunday's the fall conference. Guest speaker, food, and all kinds of good stuff. So if you're available, come out and enjoy. I think the first one's at 2, second one's at 3.30. Home plenty early. Got pizza and all kinds of food coming. And then Sunday morning, the guest speaker will be for Sunday school and for the worship service also. So it's always good. The conferences are always good and enlightening. So um, plan to be here if you're free. So let's let's go to Acts 9 and get started there. And I have a few things to bring up that I've been studying, and uh, at a certain point, <clears throat> as maybe you've noticed along in my studies, it's kind of like um, when Paul was before a Greek king Agrippa, and he gave him this great testimony of his conversion and so on, and King Agrippa th says, methinks you <laughs> Uh, you are mad from too much study or something like that and I, I begin to feel sometimes that way and I'm all over the place studying and you know how one verse will lead you to something in the Old Testament before you know it you're on to a whole other issue and but that's good and sometimes I think I'm uh, going mad from too much study but God blesses it and that's what we're supposed to do study to show thyself approved Unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what we do or attempt to do here at Berean Bible Church. Now, we had come through Israel's final opportunity to receive their Messiah, their king, their kingdom. And in the process of the stoning of Stephen, they had formally resisted blasphemed the Holy Spirit, committed the unpardonable sin, and God began to set them aside. We're in a transition period where God is setting aside Israel, the kingdom program, and transitioning into Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, and the body of Christ, message of the dispensation of grace. So, in Acts chapter 9... <clears throat> This is after we finished with Philip going to Samaria, then into Ethiopia, and then he traveled from there on up into Caesarea along the coast. So that particular period intervened between the stoning of Stephen and the conversion of Saul. And there's a great chapter, too, that uh, chapter... Chapter 8 <clears throat> was just a great one, and uh, Philip was such a great guy and such a great evangelist. And also in chapter 8, Peter and John went up to Samaria, and the Jews did not go into Samaria <laughs> to begin with, but Philip went into Samaria. They regarded the Samaritans as half-breeds, low-class, not good people, and the Samaritans didn't think too much of Israel either. But uh, Philip went up there, 
preached Christ and the kingdom, and they became converted, little flock people, and still under the law, still looking for their kingdom, looking for their Messiah, accepted him as the Messiah. And then Peter and John went up there to confirm that they and the, the, the northern section of Israel, the southern section, would be united. And he, he, bearing the keys of the kingdom that Christ had given to him, laid his hands upon them. They received the Holy Ghost. And Peter was confirming that they were accepted. And now that the northern and the southern kingdom would become one, and everybody was included there. So, that's a, a great chapter. But in chapter 9, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now, we, uh, <clears throat> we know that Saul was threatening out slaughter, breathing, threatenings, and slaughter. That's really angry. And he had heard Stephen's message. He knew about Christ. He knew about the miracles. Saul knew he had seen and heard all of they knew about the persecution, the rejection. He had heard Stephen's message, and he was pricked in the heart, cut in the heart, and under great conviction. And not only Saul, but I'm sure all those, even the Sanhedrin, the, the scribes, Pharisees, and the, and the priests, that heard Stephen's message and, and knew what all was going on. At one point, the the hierarchy said, we know that all these miracles are of power and there's nothing we can do about it. What do we do? We're just going to threaten them. But so they all knew and Saul knew and so hearing Stephen's message put him deeper under conviction because he okayed the killing, the stoning of Stephen. And uh, instead of turning to the Lord, he delved deeper into, away from his conviction, into the slaughter of those who believed. Just, you have to try to picture his mental attitude at this point, spiritual attitude too. He was in darkness, under conviction, he had heard it all. So rather than going with that way, as they call it, that way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Instead of going that way, he went the other way to try to resolve what was going on inside of his heart and mind. So what did he do? He got the letters, got okay from the hierarchy, the Supreme Court of Israel, the chief priests, and found his way on the way to Damascus. Now, he wasn't satisfied just with taking care of the issue there in the area. He's... He's 135 miles north of Jerusalem. That's how far out he's going to uh, bring back these people who believe and persecute them and prosecute them and kill them. This was his, his ministry at this point. So suddenly he sees the light from heaven that shined. Remember when the shepherds were in the field at the birth of Christ and the glory of God shone round about them. This light, God in creation, created the light. And you get to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, I think verse 23, when the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is coming down, and John describes it as there's no need for the light because the Lamb is there. The light of the lambs, just a, a light. And Paul saw that light. He goes on in chapter 22 and chapter 26 as he is repeating this event of what happened here on the road to Damascus. He calls it a light, a great light. And then he goes on later and calls it a light greater than the sun. So this was a special 
special light. Very special, because God was going to do something here. <clears throat> now, it's very interesting that, uh, and, and this is what led me into a, a variety of, of studies, that we know later that, that Saul, becoming Paul, receives the revelation from the Lord about the body of Christ. Now just take a look over at Romans, just next door to Acts, Romans chapter 12. And this is a, quite a while after Paul is converted, but let's see what he says here. Romans chapter 12. And uh, verse, um, well, in, in verse 3, starting out about the, uh, I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. You get down to, uh, let's see, verse seven, verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, and on it goes. Now, the first reference to the body of Christ is right here. So we being many are one body in Christ. Look over at, um, next to Romans, to the right, 1 Corinthians 10. And verse 17. Verse Corinthians 10, verse 17. For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we all are partakers of that one bread. And he goes, goes on and on. We're not going to read it all. But we are one body. If you turn to chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are, uh, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And again, we're talking about the body of of Christ. Uh, one more while we're here. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And I recall a while back <coughs> um, one of my bus driver friends talking about scripture and the Lord. Saved. A saved person. And uh, pulled up one of my messages on a Sunday that I had preached, and she was had watched it, and I said, "Well, what'd you th what'd you think?" And uh, she said, "Well, you sure do jump around a lot." I said, "Well, the people that come to our church never have a problem with that because they know the scripture. I let it hang there. You know, they don't mind jumping around because compare scripture with scripture, right? You got to see the whole revelation. That's what we're doing. Ephesians." Uh, chapter 1, verse 22. And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church, the body of Christ. So we, we don't need to go any further. There are other scriptures relating to the body of Christ. That's what we are. We're not the kingdom. We're not the kingdom church, we're the body of Christ church, the church of this dispensation. You go to Hebrews, the writer tells us that back in Moses' day, there was a church in the wilderness. And as soon as people see the word church, it confuses everything else they read in scripture because they don't recognize that there's always been a church. I guess you can always say where Adam and Eve were gathered, there I am with them. <laughs> wherever two or three are gathered, Jesus said that. <clears throat> That's why when, when Peter and John went up to Samaria, his words probably came to him wherever two or three. Peter didn't go alone. And they didn't need the third person, so just the two went. Wherever two or three are gathered together, I'm with you. So they remembered that. 
and uh, there's always been a church wherever and it just simply means a, a, an assembly a gathering together of people as we go on further in Acts an angry mob is referred to not as a church in the scriptures but as ecclesia one of the few Greek words I know which is valid ecclesia which means a called out gathering so that's why there was a church in the wilderness that's why you can say that when uh, the twelve sons got together they were a church under the law you come up to Acts 2 still under the law Holy Spirit came down and many were added to the church thousands were added to the church it was a kingdom church you got to know which church you're involved in where we are in Paul's revelation or God's revelation so there's always been a church this is the church in which we now exist which began with Saul of Tarsus before he ever became Paul now that's what I believe you can challenge that because when you get involved into the grace movement and most of us have been involved with denominations have we not over the years I can't count the number of denominations I kind of was associated with joined got baptized and uh, was involved to some degree moved on to another one got upset there and moved on we all know that experience We've all had that experience in dom denominationalism, and we know until you get a hold of uh, things that differ or somebody's going to tell you about the grace message, then, then things begin to come together. But all the denominations that are out there all have different beliefs, more or less. That's what makes them denominations, what makes them separate from one another. And so once we start hearing the grace message and we start to pull out of that, the next thing you know, you come into the grace fellowship and you'll find those believers also who have formed their own denomination within the grace movement because some will say even the radical grace believers will say that the church started at Acts 2 the church which is the body then some will say well it started with, with Saul of Tarsus and his conversion right here then some will say, no, um, it starts in Acts 13. Then there are those who go to Ch Acts 18, say the body of Christ began here. Then they'll go to uh, the end of Acts, chapter 28. They'll say, oh, the body began here. That's when Paul separated himself into the Gentile ministry. So what do we find within the grace movement? Denominationalism. There's what separates us. Is it not? We came to this belief to maybe just all be one in one body so that's just how I see it <clears throat> I believe this is where the body of Christ which had been hidden in God before the foundation of the world began now the next study I have in Acts which will be a week after next I think unless the pastor takes it over and he sees my video and says uh oh I better take over but, um, otherwise I'll be here and we're going to I want to explain why it's a dangerous thing to be divided upon where the body of Christ began and why it couldn't have begun somewhere else than right here I want to go through that tremendous study because it isn't just an opinion. Well, you guys can all be one in spirit and everything and still have these different opinions on where the body of Christ began. It's dangerous. Can't, should not do that. So we see that the grace movement, and I was at Grace Bible College, so I, I know this issue. From the day one to the day I left there, it had never been resolved whether the 12 were in or out of the body of Christ and it still isn't resolved I can guarantee if you visit there today they're probably talking about that same issue <laughs> never resolved well maybe we're making it too simple maybe not it's pretty simple to me if the body of Christ was founded
before the foundation of the world because it was hidden in God. Where's my... Oh, let's go, over to, <coughs> go back over to 1 Corinthians 2. Boy, you jump around a lot. Yeah, but what would you think of the message? Well, you just jump around a lot. Did it help you? Did you have any effect on you? Well, you do jump around a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that, but you got to compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now let's jump over. Let's see where I want to go to. Um, hmm. I kind of Shane and I were just talking about this this morning, chapter two. I'm in chapter one, right? Yeah, chapter two. <laughs> Sorry about that. But Shane and I were just talking about that this morning. So, so many times I'll announce a verse and a chapter, and I'll be in the wrong page, and everybody else is wondering where are we. Well, there's proof of my humanity. <laughs> it's there, folks. Ain't nothing special about me. I'm just doing what. Well, pastor does that too. And we just gave him an increase in salary. I hope he's watching this. <laughs> All right, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Thank you, Bill. And by the way, if you've got a question or a comment, don't feel free to interrupt. We're, this is not a sermon. This is Sunday school Bible study. So it's not real formal, as you can see or tell or hear. Okay, here we go. Um, the, the whole chapter is worthy of reading. But let me find what I want. Chapter 2. Well, I guess... Oh, here it is. Here it is. Uh, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not in the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. He talks about the mystery that was revealed to him in uh, Romans 15. Even the hidden wisdom of which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which, no, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the glory, the Lord of glory. And he's talking about, him, he's talking about himself. If none of, the, none of the princes of this world knew about verse 7, if they had known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. If they had known about what God had hidden in a mystery before the world began, they wouldn't have killed Christ. Had they known about the church, the body of Christ, and the rapture and the difference between prophecy and mystery, they wouldn't have killed him. Knowing that he had to suffer and die and be raised again before all this could transpire, before Saul came into the picture and the body of Christ came into the picture, they wouldn't have killed him. It says so right here. But the key to this is, in verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden, see it was hidden, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now back to Acts chapter 9. Did, did God know that Saul, who became Paul, would be the one to whom he would reveal this mystery? Before creation. In eternity, someplace, time, space, and eternity, God had that secret, the Godhead kept it to themselves. Let all of this transpire, let mankind work out his way up to this point in history. So God knew about Saul. He knew what, he knew what Israel would do. He gave them the opportunity, but he knew God's foreknowledge doesn't mean he made it happen. It means he knew it was going to happen. 
So Saul and the body of Christ was there before the world began. And all the way through all this human history, the 6,000 going on 7,000 years of it, until the body of Christ was revealed, was hidden in God. So all that human history unfolded before God's time was to reveal it and to see Saul so it took dramatic action on God's, God's part, did it not, to get grab a hold of this Saul and allow Saul to bring that conviction he had to the full. So Saul had no clue about what was hidden in God, which he will have later, but he had no clue. So, Paul's on his way back to Acts 9, threatening out slaughter, on his way to Damascus, way, way up north. And by the way, Saul is from Tarsus, and in today's map you'll find that in southern Turkey. That's where he was from. But apparently his parents were Hebrew, raised him up under the law, raised him up, knew the word, he knew the Old Testament, went to school, to college, learned it from Gamaliel, became one of the hierarchy, young man, and now he's carrying out what he thinks is his duty to kill those who follow Christ. And this voice said, verse 4, He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He wasn't quite sure, but he knew it was some Lord. And notice, <clears throat> we met, pointed out before last week, I think, that the persecution that was taking place was against the people of God, the Lord's people, the Messiah's people. And notice the Lord said, you're persecuting me, because in persecuting them, persecuting me. And I think the comment last Sunday was what the Lord said, what you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. Whatever you do, good. Too, you're doing it to him for him in his behalf beautiful so uh, he didn't know for sure who it was but in verse 5 he said who art thou Lord and the Lord said I am Jesus no question about it he knew who Jesus was he had been one of those who rejected him mocked him perhaps involved in the hierarchy and saying go ahead and kill him he had heard all the message of Stephen leading up to and Peter's messages where he, where the hierarchy was confu uh, con uh, accused of murder and slaughter against the Lord they knew all of it. they heard all of it. they knew about the resurrection but let's deny it let's push it away let's persecute those who believe in it why? Jealous. Were they jealous? The hierarchy? A king over them? Absolutely. So their jobs were at stake. Yeah. Their pensions were in peril. <laughs> their six finger <laughs> finger six figure salary, as I know local church pastors get. Six figure was in jeopardy. And in those days, in comparison, whatever the money value was, six figures. It was all jeopardized. But didn't the Lord say that he was going to provoke them to jealousy? To try to get them involved, to believe? Paul, Paul writes it later. They are provoking them to jealousy by going to the Gentiles. Okay, um, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I mean, great response. I mean, if when you can remember, when you came to the Lord, there was a point in your life when you accepted Christ, I can remember it. If the first words had been, Lord, what will you have me to do? I, I didn't. <laughs> but it came to me later, I could hear it like kind of in my head my heart 
what he had me to do, and uh, it became evident. But here, his first response is like Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah was caught up and could see the glory of the throne of God and all the rumblings and tremblings and thunder and lightning and fire and smoke and the cherubim were there uh, milling around and praying and praising God. I and mean, there's a wonder, back and read it sometime, Isaiah 6. It's beautiful. And uh, Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. He said, There's nobody else. And Isaiah finally said, Here am I, send me. And he said, I am undone. I am a man undone. This is Isaiah the prophet. Seeing the throne and blurred images of the Lord and maybe saw Jesus. He's the visible, earthly, bodily image of God. Can be seen. The angel in the Old Testament could see him. And... Uh, when he saw that, he said, I am undone. When compared to the throne and the face of Christ, I am undone. And it's maybe good to get undone once in a while, you know, because there's nowhere to go except to the Lord. Nowhere to go. And here am I, his final, Isaiah's final words was, here am I, send me. There was nobody else. That's, that's why God gave him the vision. He said, who am I going to send? Man, I messed up, I'm ready to do <laughs> Now I'm not so much undone. I'm ready to go. I've seen the Lord. And Isaiah, what a great prophet, shows up as one of the prophets who were sawn asunder in Hebrews chapter 11 <clears throat> they killed of course killed the prophets some of them were sawn S-A-W-N asunder with a saw part of the execution back in those days if you look it up in archaeology was uh, they would get these big logs and hollow them out find them in the forest and they, whoever they wanted to kill they'd stick them in there cap the ends and saw right down the middle sawn asunder I think Isaiah was sawn asunder well on we go trembling, trembling and astonished Lord what will you have me to do and the Lord said unto him here's what you to do arise go into the city to be told thee what thou must do and the man who journeyed with him the men stood speechless Hearing a voice, but seeing no man, only Saul was able to see the Lord. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, apparently had his eyes closed during this occasion, when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So the last image that Saul had seen here was the Lord Jesus himself. He looked at him. Bright light was there, but he looked at him. The light greater than the sun, he says in chapter 26. But he saw that image. He saw him. Resurrected. Could he see the nail prints and the scar on his side and the gashes in his brow from the thorns? Could he see that? Absolutely. When John looked at the throne in Revelation, what did he see? A lamb bearing the marks of slaughter. That's the Lord. He had the marks of slaughter. The gashes in his back from the thrashing and whipping. And I'm sure Saul could see that because when Jesus appeared to the, the apostles, who was it that said, unless I put my finger in his hands, Thomas, the doubting Thomas, and in his side, I won't believe. So he bore those marks when he came back from the grave and was resurrected and ascended into heaven. He bore those marks, and that will be seen by those who view him 
during that revelation day. He'll carry those marks for eternity. So when Saul first looked at him, he saw the marks. He knew that, who are you? Hmm, I think I know. He knew about the crucifixion. He knew about the burial. He knew about the resurrection. And now he sees it. Paul was the first to recognize the gospel of the body of Christ. This is our gospel, he says, that Christ was crucified, dead, buried, and rose again the third day. Saul knew that now. He saw the living gospel before him and then blinded. The last image he had for those next three days was only him. Only the Lord. That's all he could see in his mind. For the next three days, cause it says... He was blind for those three days until Ananias was sent to him. To me, it's very dramatic. Uh, this, this whole event, very dramatic. And you start to put yourself in Saul's place. When you have characters come up in the scripture, you know they're human beings just like us. They're no different. They just didn't have cell phones or, there it is, cell phones or automobiles you know, and didn't have the utilities they had to pay and all that stuff. They had taxes, of course, but they're just like us. You see pictures that artists have made of the apostles, and they're all wearing the robes and, the, you know, long beards and sandals and pictures of Christ. And you get an image in, in your mind that they're not like us. They're just a little different. George Washington, for one. You see, art, artwork of George Washington with the wig and the, the tight coat and pants, like tight pants and shoes with buckles and all that. And it's hard to relate to that guy as ever having lived because we only know how it is now with us. So put yourself in Saul's place, seeing the Lord. And... Uh, starting to find out that what's happening to him was founded in God before the foundation of the world. He comes to realize this later. His conversion was founded in Christ before the foundation of the world. So was mine. <laughs> so was yours. But this is the dynamic one which charts out the rest of Scripture. Dynamic. And in verse 8, Saul arose from the earth. When his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they had led him by the hand, brought him into Damascus. He was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now, possibly he couldn't. <laughs> he was just too upset too emotional, too spiritually messed up, too couldn't see anything. Besides, he was blind. And you put yourself in his place, I don't think I would eat or drink much either. Three days. Three days reminded me of something else, too. Remember Jonah? Three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, dark. Couldn't see. I personally believe he died and was resurrected because Christ, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, referred to Jonah as himself being dead, buried, and resurrected in three days. So Jonah and the Lord himself, and now Saul, three days, three nights, in darkness. And then, here comes a very neat little story a, there was a certain disciple certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias and to him said the Lord in a vision Ananias and he said behold I am here Lord Isaiah here am I send me or he didn't want to go up first as we read on um, 
I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight. Uh, by the way, Damascus is still there. And the street called Straight is still there. You can Google it. I did. <laughs> go straight through the middle of Damascus, still there. Be interesting to find the house of Judas, wouldn't it? Well, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Oh, now we know what Saul was doing for three days and three nights. He wasn't eating or drinking. He was praying. Can you imagine that conversation with the Lord? Whoa. We don't get any feedback on what that was. But again, you know, imagine what in the world was going on there. A lot of repenting, huh? <laughs> Repent, yeah, and be baptized, because he's baptized later. That's good. You always come up with a good one. <clears throat> okay, let's, let's read on. We're running out of time. <clears throat> uh, go into there, and Paul's, uh, Saul of Tarsus is praying, and he hath seen a vision, in a vision, a man named Ananias coming in, put his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So Saul got the same vision. Ananias saw the vision that from God he had to go to, Anan uh, to Saul and Saul got the vision, the word from God that this guy was coming, this Ananias was coming. So he's coming in <clears throat> and he saw in the vision that he put his hand on him, the Lord told him, that he might get his sight back. Isn't it interesting, just a certain disciple we read later in Paul's account of this, chapter 22, that Ananias was a devout man, a disciple, and that he had a good report among the Jews. So along the line, he had, maybe he'd been down to Jerusalem to Pentecost or the feast days, been introduced to the Lord as his Messiah, received him as his Messiah, and became a member of the little flock that little flock of Jews who, although it says thousands, but small in comparison, the little flock who had agreed to follow their Messiah. Knew that he was dead and buried and resurrected. Knew that he ascended into heaven. They said, yes, he's our king, our Messiah, our savior. That Those people later are called the little flock. Separate from the big flock, of Israel that did not believe, who were responsible for rejecting Christ, crucifying him, and responsible for being totally rejected as a nation, as a people, by God. Paul tells it later in Romans that we set them aside. God set them aside until the time of the Gentiles be come in. When the time of the Gentiles ends, and you know when that is, 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord shall descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us who are alive and remain be caught up in the air to be with him forevermore. That's when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end, and we don't have a date for that. We don't know when that is. It's been 2,000 years since that announcement, since Israel was set aside, since Saul of Tarsus was raised up, and told us in First Thessalonians about that event. It's been 2,000 years. So we're on an any time, any moment basis. Like I stopped this morning to get the newspaper over here and <clears throat> the guy that was working and the, another customer just standing there gabbing. And uh, we were talking about the cool, cold weather now and uh, the clerk says, and he's an old guy. You know how those old guys are. He said, he said uh, well, probably where we're going, it'll be hot anyhow. And uh, I thought, hmm, pretty, pretty nice to know where you're going to go. And the other guy says, praise the Lord. <laughs> so I had to get out of there because I was coming over here. And... Uh, 
I said, boy, there's, what do you think of that? Praise the Lord. The other guy's just standing there, and I said, uh, what did I say? I said, you better know, you need to know, I'll be back. I said, Arnold, I'll be back. So he just kind of standing there and says, have a good day. I said, well, you too. <laughs> He's under conviction, folks. I'm going back. I ought to think of some candy bar I need to buy or something. Anyhow, here comes Ananias. <clears throat> you got to go see this saw. State Street. Straight Street. Verse 12, he's seen a vision. A man named Ananias coming. Put his hand on him. He might receive his sight. Then... And this Ananias is a good guy, as we recall. Disciple, devout, uh, good report among the Jews. He had a great reputation, just, but just a disciple. Not just a plain, ordinary, common day man, like most of us. Nothing, not an apostle. A disciple, that's a follower, member of the little flock. And verse 13, Ananias answered and said, Lord... I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon his name. Apparently the word had gotten from Jerusalem that Saul had gone and received letters from the hierarchy, the Sanhedrin, to go chase after these believers all the way up 135 miles north into Damascus breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Going to bring him back and kill him. Wow. And they had heard about it all the way up in Damascus already. News travels fast. Verse 15, here it is. But the Lord said unto him, thus to Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. He's not going to be, he is to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way. Ananias didn't stop arguing or didn't go his way until God told him that I'm sending him to the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. All Ananias knew was the Gentiles were dogs. He did not, there was no clue anywhere that this was going to go by a special preacher, minister to the Gentiles. He's a member of the little flock. He doesn't know this. Very interesting. Remember that. Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul. A whole big revelation came at that point because God had told him he's a chosen vessel unto me. He's going to bear my name and suffer a lot of stuff. So Ananias went and put his hand on him and called him brother. He said, The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, here am I, send me, said Isaiah, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ghost. Here's a key point. This was not Peter or John or any of the apostles with the authority and the keys of kingdom to put their hand on Saul that he might receive the Holy Ghost. Remember they had to go up into Samaria so that the Samaritans who now believed could receive the Holy Ghost? Who do we have here putting their hands on Saul that they might receive the Holy Ghost? A disciple, an ordinary guy. Never heard of him before, you never hear of him again. A member of the little flock, in this case, apart from Jerusalem, apart from Peter and John, received the Holy Spirit by this member of the little flock putting his hands on him. It did not need any authority with it other than that. Prior to this, the Holy Ghost was only granted to those 
who were in the presence of one of the twelve apostles from Jerusalem because they, Peter, had the keys, keys to the kingdom. This Ananias has no keys. He's not representing, he is a member of the, the kingdom and the law and looking for the Messiah. He's still a member of the little flock he believes, but he had no special power. It's interesting that Saul's beginning in receiving the Holy Ghost was totally separate and apart from any authority of Jerusalem. He, being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a member of the high supreme court, the Sanhedrin of Israel, receiving the Holy Ghost by Ananias, <clears throat> who will never hear of again. Just a guy. I mean, it should en 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 enlighten us and empower us a little bit, shouldn't it? We're not going to pass the Holy Ghost on to anybody. Also, we learn from First Thessalonians or First uh, Ephesians chapter one that when you hear the word of truth and you receive it, the Holy Ghost comes in and seals you. That had never been done before. Anybody else in Scripture ever been sealed? Throughout all the Old Testament up to this point, through the Gospels, the Holy Spirit would come and go and come and go. He would go in. He would go on. He would go into, upon. Not a word about being sealed. So if Saul, Saul's conversion introduced the body of Christ, whether he didn't know a thing about it yet, but this is where it began. Paul was sealed, Saul was sealed by the Holy Ghost at this point. Did he not receive the same Holy Ghost that he talks about in Ephesians 1? That when you receive Christ, you're sealed. The Holy Spirit comes into you and seals you, puts his brand on you. Can't take it away. You can grieve him. Anyhow, it's all starting to unfold at this point. And immediately, in verse 18, there fell from his eyes that it, as it had been scales, and he received sight, and arose, and was baptized. Still, the conditions of the law are still moving on. Even though God had put an end to it, he's going to let it transition into the body of Christ. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples who were at Damascus. Isn't it interesting? Saul went into the house of Judas. A man came to him named Ananias, and Saul's name was Saul. Does it sound like God's redeeming the names? You remember Ananias? Back in early Acts, stricken down because he lied to the Holy Ghost, kept back some of his money, he was cast down dead. Bad name, Ananias. Judas! What did he do? Betrayed Christ. And Saul. Remember King Saul? Kind of good for a while, then despicable toward the end. Just a bad guy. So it's like here you have Judas, Ananias, and Saul. It's like God's redeeming those negative names and putting a good light on them for the future. But I don't recall anybody naming their kids Judas. Anyhow, or Saul, I, hard to come by a Saul, any, anyhow. We're going to have to end there, we're way over time. I hope you've been able to stay with me in my ramblings. I appreciate you being here and giving me the opportunity. So Lord, we thank you again for the time, for the opportunity to know more about your word and see this great transition taking place in the history of mankind. So we... Uh, ask you to guide us as we continue in our worship service and that we may glean more truth and also above all glorify you in christ's name amen